Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground captures the creative process of various artists living in our region. We're delving into the veiled history of our area, plus we take you inside the cultural events that put the North in North Country. On this week's episode of Common Ground, meet Julie Sari, a blogger from Bemidji who's capturing the stories of those who can say, this is my town, Bemidji. Noel Mills, a retired heart surgeon of Bacchus, is keeping his finger on the pulse of the monarch butterfly population. And Colleen Donnelly is talking about a local historical gem in downtown Staples. I started a website that is in a blog format and a blog is just an open format for anybody to write publicly or privately um, whatever you want um, and I called it this is my town Bemidji it's based off I live here SF for San Francisco but San Francisco being bigger can say that I felt like to me, it's a town. It's small enough to still be a town, so I called it, this is my town Bemidji. Um, and basically what it is, is people in town or around town that love this town, that appreciate what this town has to offer, write a story about themselves based around the town. This particular project I've been doing since February, blogging itself, I've been doing for over a year. I started um, December of last year. And I started with my own personal blog um, just as a way to, it was actually a way to appease my friend because I would rant on the phone about certain whatever happened at the store or something on the news. And she said, oh, you should write that down. Your perspective is hilarious and different. And I, you know, no, I'll just tell you. And then for Christmas, she said, all I want is for you to start a blog. And so I did. And it was great as a stay-at-home mom to have that place where I could actually you know, talk to people and, and uh, then get, you get comments, people comment back, other bloggers. And uh, so I've been doing that for over a year and through that um, I came across a lady in San Francisco named Julie Michelle who had a blog and she became unemployed. She was one of the many, you know, struck by the economy, lost her job and started roaming the street with her camera and ended up in San Francisco. She ended up in um, one part of the town and took a picture of a lady in a store and sat and listened to her story because she had nothing else to do. She was unemployed and she wrote her story down. And it started from there. Other people seemed to like it and so she started doing it and she made out one call basically that said, you know, do you want to write a story and tell me, tell me your story about San Francisco? And then she took the pictures and she's never asked a person since because they've all been saying, I want to tell you my story. And I've been following that for over a year, thinking, oh, I should do that here. I should do that here. I should do that in Bemidji. I should follow through. And after a year, I finally decided to do the same thing. And uh, so I made a cold call to Mike Wiltsey at the tattoo parlor after I saw his art here at the Wild Hair. I figured an artist um, and a tattoo artist at that, he being both, would maybe be a little more laid back and willing to try something. Because I had nothing. I had no website. I had a camera. I didn't even have my camera with when I asked him. <laughs> you know, I just like popped into a store and said, hey, would you want to? I said, this may go nowhere. You may be the only one. And he, I said, if nothing else, you get some pictures out of it. Maybe. <laughs> and he said, sure, I have a story. And I said, well, do you want me to help you? He's like, no, I know my story. I have a story. And he did, and it's a great story. And so from there, that gave me confidence then to ask somebody else. And uh, after it, you ask two people and they do it and they do great, then it's like, I can do this. And so um, I've been doing it since, and I've, I've had to ask people, unlike Julie in California, people are a little more humble here. They're a little more, um, I don't really have a story. Nobody cares about me. We're raised that way, though. 
We're raised to just kind of be like everyone else and achieve, but just don't brag. Don't brag, I guess, is what it is. You know, a lot of that I even find myself doing that to my kids. And I think it's very Minnesotan. When I have asked people to participate in this project, I have looked for the everyman, the common day. I don't want necessarily the headliner of, of and gladly, oh, gladly I'll take their story. But a lot of people already know their story. Well, they assume they know their story, which is why I would gladly take their story because there's always this, you know, a story that you're not telling about yourself. But what I'm looking for is the common person, the person that seems every day, the person that seems, you know, blends into the masses, but each of us is individual and each of us is amazing and each of us makes up this town in a certain way and if one of us left, it would matter some way. And I'd like to capture how that person, that everyday person is special. But my idea of having an open invitation is because um, if I only ask people, then it's not a very good picture of Bemidji. It's my Bemidji, it's not Bemidji. Because I only know a certain amount of people and um, it would just be the life in Julie then, you know, Julie goes here and she talks to this person, she goes here and she talks to this person, whereas if somebody out of the blue contacts me, that's a much better picture of the town. You know, I don't want just the people that are out in the public every day, I want the tow truck, tow truck driver, I want the guy that picks up my garbage, I want, you know, the guy that works behind the in the storeroom in some store, you know, everyone has a story. I just want to know it. I'm trying to keep a lot of my stuff downtown and I find it very interesting that the people that I get their stories connect with downtown, which is awesome because that's how downtown lives. Um, so it's a great promotional tool for the town um, and it gives people that live here pride. It's very important to be proud of where you live, um, especially when it's 32 below and you're trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing here and why am I not <laughs> where it's warm, you know? But then on those days, those are the days that you find people smiling and they're smiling because, you know, we're hardy and, and the, the hardy people are out on those days and it's almost like I've accomplished something by, you know, conquering 32 below. And um, so my hope is that um, it helps promote the town, that it gives people a sense of pride, that, um, People, people feel more connected. Um, and I think eventually it'll help people respect their townspeople because you only usually get a few seconds of meeting and there's, there's a lot behind a person that we don't know. There's a very interwebbed connection in this town which makes it feel very close and personal. So that to me is the common ground that I'm finding with all of these stories. My name is Noel Mills, and um, I live part-time in Mississippi and part-time here in northern Minnesota. And in Mississippi, we had a tree farm until Katrina came along. And now about the only thing that I'm really farming is monarch butterflies. Up here in Minnesota, these caterpillars come out every year and feed on the milkweed and then they go through a couple of cycles and then they head off and migrate all the way to Mexico. In uh, New Orleans, we see them when we cross the bridges by the tens of thousands headed uh, across the Gulf of Mexico to Mexico. I've been trying to save as many of these as I can because the population of monarchs over the last few years has really dropped off considerably and it's thought to be due to the fact that there's so much deforestation that's going on in the area where they are basically required to uh, winter. Uh, their numbers have to be uh, at a certain level because their body heat actually keeps them warm on the few cold nights that they have down in Mexico. So it's important to try to keep the numbers as high as possible. When you um, pick up a caterpillar, such as I've done today, if you decide you want to try to keep it, uh, looks like we have one here. Right. Now what I do is 
take this whole plant and just pull gently so he won't be bounced off. Look at the milkweed plant that it's on and be sure that there's no spiders, assassin bugs, uh, no spider eggs, or anything that you think might be able to damage this caterpillar. And uh, once you've done that, put this milkweed in a bottle of water, which will keep it the longest, and um, let him eat. Now the problem is you're going to have to replenish this every day or two because these leaves do tend to wilt. And so if they start wilting, you would like to change to uh, new lettuce, so to speak, for the caterpillar. It's really neat to see the caterpillars when they change within, oh, a minute and a half from a caterpillar to a chrysalis. I have a place that I put them in that they will be free from any pests getting them, as long as I'm careful not to introduce any when I put the uh, plant in and uh, I just let them do their thing and feed them and then once you they become a chrysalis if they have been drilled by an assassin bug or some type of um, predator there's not too much you can do about that but you can put them out next to your flowers here in the garden and just enjoy the fact that you'll get up in the morning especially if it's a summer day if it's a bit warm you will find that they are actually coming out. And I think like yesterday, we had four all at once just come out. And this boy, he's gonna have his birthing day tomorrow. If you look carefully inside, when they turn dark, you can actually see the monarch pattern's wings uh, when he's ready to go. And he'll take his bottom foot and uh, start a hole and just tear it open as if you would a cellophane envelope and away he goes. Now when these make a chrysalis, he'll have to be about three times larger than what he is now. You'll notice that there's a point that he stops eating and he starts traveling. And he'll go up and down, up and down, and he'll be looking for a place. And you can put some sticks into your little uh, caterpillar area or to uh, give him something to hang on to if you want to. Uh, but anyway, he will spin enough web so that his posterior end is actually stuck to a leaf or a twig. He'll form a J shape and hang there and then he will begin to take off his sweater, so to speak and he takes it off from below up and there'll be all of this skin will be up at the top uh, where he's stuck. It actually it comes from the head up to right up where he's stuck onto the uh, twig. That'll fall away and after that falls away what you'll see is this gorgeous chrysalis with the little gold marks on it. All of the species, no matter what it is, fits into nature at one point. Monarch caterpillar is something that's probably been here more than 10,000 years working on these milkweeds for us. And um, wouldn't it be interesting to know uh, how he knows to go to that same 40 acre forested area in Mexico? What's in his DNA that allows him to do that? Unless one is really committed to doing the things properly, choosing the right kind of plant, these don't eat lettuce from the refrigerator, they don't eat other types of weeds, milkweed is it. So unless one is really serious, it's best to just leave the caterpillar on the milkweed. He'll fill up and he'll find a place to make his chrysalis and go from there. I do just a very small part. It may or may not be significant, but it's fun, it's interesting, and um, this is really a jewel of nature when you see one of these apple green jade chrysalises with the little gold dots on it, or you see these striped uh, beauties that are chomping away at the milkweed and um, filling up so they can turn themselves into a chrysalis.
We are in your imagination. <laughs> no, I think we are in our dream. It's our dream come true to be here and to have you and your guest here today. 1907 All Original Opera House. It's in, located in Staples, downtown Main Street, Minnesota. It's the heart of the highway. Um, and um, Staples today is revitalizing for us, but uh, for Chris and I, we are now again opening for you, and, and uh, so you are located in, to us, our dream. In 2002, um, my, I went to an uh, appointment, I had a, a lump, and I thought, well, I better go in and get this checked, so I told no one. And when I got out of that appointment, they diagnosed me with cancer. So that was the first like, shock that every family that goes through this, I'm sure, remembers that first day. So I had to get a cell phone battery, so I went and got a cell phone battery and walked across the street, and as I stepped off the curb, I got hit by a truck. And that truck drug me 10 feet, and I'm laying there thinking, is this it? And I think that's probably the most dramatic moment for people when they get diagnosed, is like, it, I think you get to that point where there has to be something bigger. And when I got home, it was kind of a blessing because everybody focused on my foot. And my twin brother took it the hardest. Um, and so for the next six months, while my sister and my parents just surrounded my son and I, who was only two and a half years old at the time, processing cancer like so many families do, he went up and down the highway looking for an extreme home. And what happened is he stumbled upon Mark Bounds, uh, Rainbow Realty, and he says, well, we have one newly listed for 11 days. And he said, it has a little music hall over there. And my twin walked over here to a one family owned building, the Batcher family, and he walked up and literally climbed over this room, mounds of storage, up these stairwells, and pulled open the door and a hundred year old light panel and flipped up the lights and you are seeing what you see today. That night I got home from chemo and he talked to me, I drove to his home and he talked till five o'clock in the morning. We drove the next day and um, it was without any, with me even seeing it, that we purchased it that day. A um, hundred and four years ago, Charles Batcher built over 200 homes here in this town. He was an architect. And if these walls could talk, we've heard it. Um, we hired an uh, architect writer to have him come and unveil that history. That's never been done for this building. But when we uncovered Charles Batcher's history here for Staples, for ourselves, basically, um, he had four businesses on the main floor that all faced Fifth Street, and it all happened because of the train, the depot that was here and is still here. All the trains turned here, and tens of thousands of people were standing stationary, milling around on these streets at any given time. This is the traveler's rest. So when all these famous plays came to town, there was over four opera houses in this, in this town, hotels, restaurants, so we're revitalizing today in hopes that the traveler rest again. But the train is, a, uh, this building housed the train conductor's offices, for example. And all these famous plays, the women wore their long dresses and fur coats here, and the other ones, they wore their blue jeans. So when Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who was a very famous playwright from New York, when her famous plays, like the black cat that she invented, the sayings about the black cat, when her plays, The Seven Days, the famous comedy that played 500 weeks in, on Broadway, came here, and when John Philip Sousa came here, when those famous plays that were unveiled in the historic documents, I guess that to me is the story of the history of what happened here. And it goes on and on, which is why we're giving tours today to tell the story. I guess the thing that impresses me the most about Mrs. Batcher is the fact that when I read stories about her three-year-old boy that sat up in the balcony and the courage that it took her raising a family under such you know, heavy construction and how patient the Batchers were to do it right. This building is so overbuilt structurally. The architects and the tours that we have given thousands of people that have walked the rafters and the basements and have said that this man and woman, when they did it, they did it right. And I guess our story with the cancer was we were told you have one year. And when you're told you have one year, what kind of business plan do you make? Um, well, Louis Anderson helped with that. Louis Anderson walks in, he makes the journey up the steps to see our magical house here. 
And he says, I want to be your first show. Well, our local band director, quite famous at that, he says, uh, I said, will you be our first show and perform the John Philip Sousa musical here, our orchestra he was putting together. So he was our first show. But I think, um, so I guess that's what prompted us to do, you know, that first restoration was to call up Susan Roth and ask her, what can we do? And still, as this document was making its process through the registry, and she says, the first thing you do not want to do is touch the walls. So when our, when our travelers come in, they gasp, they, they, they step back, and they say, it's still here. The National Register of Historic Places said, don't touch it. We have never seen one. What you have found is, a, is something that we usually get a property like yours. We have to tear through layers, find a photograph, and attempt to recreate what we are looking at. And they stamped it, National Register of Historic Places. And I guess that is, to me, our, our biggest victory. And so when you talk about restoration, I like to talk about reverberation. Because to Chris and I, Frost Twins, we want to tell the world, and we want to take our opera hall to the world. And our story is just one of the many thousands that we've heard. When people walk in this magical building, it literally inspires them to go back home and dream again. And I guess that's the story here. Um, we want a webcam every show. We want a webcam every tour. We want a webcam from the time they walk in to the time they go. And it's rock and roll, 50s and blues, and bring your dancing shoes. And so when these folks leave our Midwest for the winter time, and they, they don't know what's going on, we want them to be able to log on and capture their granddaughter on the stage singing or the live music that's playing and their grandma dancing. And to be able to never let go of that captured moment so that someday it's also recorded. We are gonna have a restaurant here. We do have a bar, it's called the Boxcar Bar, and we are gonna have a bed and breakfast, and there's going to be so much more. So a business plan, it is important. And I have learned from my twin and from my son that perhaps it should be longer than one year. But I don't think I would ever take back living as if you only had one. Chris and I have hosted all over 60 shows here, proms and uh, wedding dances, but our, probably our favorite shows have been the Staples Historic Band, but also the Mickey Rooney Show and Louie Anderson and Scott Hansen. And here's some of the signatures from those shows. But back in 1907, when the plays came through town, it was very popular back in the day for the entertainers that came off the trains to sign backdrops wherever they performed. Okay, well, 100 years ago, this is where all the folks came to the Opera Hall. The women wore their long dresses and fur coats to this one, and um, there was four opera houses in Staples, so this is the Grand Opera House, which is why we're calling it the Grand Opera House, located in the Badger Block. So right here is the 100-year-old ticket booth. So for 100 years ago, this is where they bought their tickets for the shows. But because of the train 100 years ago, all these conductors that came off the train and had to rest at the Traveler's Rest, they um, reserved rooms up here. So these rooms have doorways lining the interiors of them, boom, 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 all the way down on two floors. We have a catering uh, kitchen set up for when caterers, licensed caterers come in to, pre to pre uh, present their catered meals, but we will have a restaurant on the main floor. Our future plans are for, we have a blueprint drawn for a bed and breakfast. So on the second floor, we'll be housing a bed and breakfast. Every tour we've given, all the entertainers who have come, including you know Mickey Rooney and his wife, they all want to stay here. I mean, that like on the stage, there's two doorways, and they're sealed up in, the, in here now. But the, the entertainers, when they performed here, they came off the stage into this suite. So this is the magic suite. This is on the document. This is where all the magic happened. So when Louis Anderson, Mickey Rooney, and Lamont Cranston performed here, so this is where all the entertainers stayed. With all of us, you know, we want to for sure record where we've been. And I think why I'm excited about Staples today is that they do recognize where they've been. But when I see an effort, a uh, cumulative effort of where they want to go, I know that Chris and I have, have had the right vision. 
and that is to live your life as if you only have one year and then embrace the environment that you, the choices that you've made with your dreams and then go out and take this uh, restoration and reverberate it throughout the whole world with the technologies that our young children are bringing like my son has with this internet and uh, the Wi-Fi capabilities that we have now um, to be able to share these talented people and these travelers that come by these beautiful um, 30 mile an hour traffic opportunities that we still have in our town and uh, see our history uh, unfold. And I guess that's what Chris and I are doing today is that we're opening up for you. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, Contact us at legacy at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4th, 2008.